about that yourself this morning. So why don't we let Joseph tell us his own story of the role he was chosen to play in the unfolding events of the first Christmas. So you're curious, are you, about how it came to be that I, a simple carpenter, should have a part of the Christmas story, are you? Well, the short answer to that is that that was part of God's plan for my life. But it's a little more involved than that. Let me try to explain if you have a few moments. You see, I wasn't the only one who desired Mary's hand. Oh, no, no. There were others... Who, who must have tempted their father with what they would have had to offer his daughter. But he had put off the fathers of these other suitors in his usual brusque manner, saying, Ah, there's, there's plenty of time for that. Plenty of time. But I was sure that my time was running out. Well, if I was to have her, my father, Jacob, would have to act quickly. Now, we were of good stock, you know, the very house and lineage of David himself, <laughs> but we were poor and in no position to compete with anyone. Now when I would press my father, he would reply, oh, choose someone else, Joseph. Take Leah. She's been mooning over you for years. <laughs> and then he would remind me again of how that other Jacob, you know, the one he was named after, had waited 14 years for his Rachel. And I would point out that I was not so strong and uh, would ask him again to please speak to her father for me before it was too late. You see, along with what my own meager savings and what father was able to pull together, we had enough to offer the marriage portion that the law required. But a little more than that, I'm afraid. Oh, but listen, I can still see father coming down, bounding down the hill that day, bringing the wonderful news that I had been accepted. Mary was to be my wife. Oh my goodness, I can hardly believe it. The, the terms would be worked out later, but right then, it was time to celebrate. My goodness. I quickly began to, to plan the house that we would build. We'd live close to my workshop, but we'd be alone, Mary and me, in a house that would be a credit to my darling wife. You know, I was still dazed by the wonder of all that was to be. That, that she would be mine. Mine to come home to. Mine to, to protect and provide for. Mine to love and oh, yes, I did love her. But, but enough with idle danger. There were things to do. The betrothal, of course, would be first. That would mean that we were husband and wife, linked by the law, but not yet in the flesh. But you see, according to our custom, that final union must wait until the formal wedding celebration, which wouldn't be for at least a year. Now, on the day of my betrothal, I, I took a long time to, to bathe and, and dress. You see, I wanted everything to be as perfect as I could make him. But one thing troubled me, these hands. Although I scrubbed them nearly raw and, and rubbed uh, oil into them, I could do nothing about their roughness or these scarred and broken fingernails. I mean, after all, these were the hands of a carpenter, and sometimes they get in the way, you know? But you see, I didn't want them clasping her hand to be harsh or, or to snag that delicate betrothal veil. Well, when the evening is over, I have spoken aloud the prescribed words that I would work for her and honor her in the manner of a good Jewish husband. <laughs> but. Just as I had feared, my fingers had caught in that veil of hers. Now, in the weeks that followed, I moved in and out of Mary's life as much as possible, in spite of her mother watching us like a hawk. <laughs> now, sometimes Mary and her father would walk over and inspect my progress on the house, which, which was coming along quite well. 
with the help of family and friends, that is. Oh, it would be a good, strong house, sturdy and graceful as it clung to the hillside. And it gave me special satisfaction to know that it would join no other house. That way, it could be expanded so our children would have more room. Our children, Mary's and mine. I never will forget that evening when Mary came alone to the house just at sunset. Then there was a look in her eyes that troubled me. We must talk, Joseph, she said softly. As I came down off the ladder, she, she backed up against one of the floor posts and clung to it as if it were her only means of support. As I approached, she whispered, Don't come any nearer, Joseph, please. I beg you. Please, Joseph. Don't touch me. Joseph, there's something I must tell you. Her lips trembled, and, and, and it was a moment before she could go on. Joseph, I, I am I, I am with child. With child? Pregnant? The words exploded in my mind like, like crashes of, of thunder. How, how could she? How, how could my sweet Mary be pregnant? No, bewilderment. I could only stare at her for what must have seemed an eternity. And, and then I spoke the question that was raging in my mind. Who? Who did this to you, Mary? To which she replied that she didn't know. You don't know? Well, you matter. You think I am? What do you mean? You don't know. You, you have to know. You're the only one who can know. I could see she was struggling to try to find the words to help me understand. At last, drawing a deep breath, she went on to say, Joseph, an angel of the Lord, God, came to me and told me that I had been chosen to be the one whose body would bring the Christ child into the world. Oh, Joseph, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. There must be some mistake, I said to him. I, I, I'm still a virgin, just a simple handmaiden of the Lord. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel said. So the Holy One to be born of you will be the Son of God. She went on to tell me how it had already begun to come to pass. Her mother had, in fact, confirmed the fact that she was with child. Joseph, it can only be the child of the Holy One himself, she said, since I have known no other man, not even you, Joseph. Still in shock, I said, the, 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 the chosen one, the, the, the Messiah that, that we've been expecting for so long, to which she cried, you don't believe me, do you, Joseph? And I said, Mary, Mary, I, I do believe, I'm trying to believe. God, God will keep his promise. That Christ will come for us one day. But, but not now. Not in our town. And, and, and surely not to you and to me, Mary. No, no. This great honor should fall upon some other woman who's not already pledged to a man who, who loves her more than life itself. It was all just too much for me to try to comprehend. I had worked hard that day and for many days before, and it was just impossible for me to think all these things through so quickly. But what I didn't understand was that my Mary was a child it was not mine. We stopped seeing each other after that. To, to, to be with her was, was just too painful for both of us. But for some reason, each evening I still trudged doggedly up the path to my unfinished house. However, it was no longer a joy to work there. The walls were dead now. <laughs> It was more like a tomb, a, a prison. I, I brooded constantly over, over the several courses of action that would be open to me. The first was, was unthinkable. That would be public denunciation of Mary, with the possibility even of death by stoning. The second, a more likely possibility, would be to give her a bill of divorcement and send her away quietly to have the baby elsewhere and hope that somehow 
she might find a new life for herself among strangers. And for many long nights I would lay awake thinking those same ghastly thoughts and arriving always at the same awful conclusions. Ah, but then that one night, as I, I tossed about again and restlessly, it, it, it seemed like I wasn't alone. You know, the, the sense of another's presence was so strong that I finally cried out, Who are you? Who, who, and where are you? What do you want? And I tried to open my eyes. Ha! The light was blinded. And I heard a voice. It's all right, Joseph. Don't be afraid. I am a messenger sent from God to tell you that you must not fear to take Mary for your wife. For that which is conceived in her is indeed of the Holy Spirit, as she has said. As I waited, the voice continued. She will bear a son, Joseph, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Then I begged not to be marked. Whoever, whoever you are, whether from heaven or from hell, in God's name, don't torment me any further. But it's true, Joseph, the voice went on. Don't you remember the prophecy of Isaiah? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Joseph, that prophecy has now been fulfilled, so delay no longer in taking Mary as your wife. Now, what happened after that? I'm not real sure. Uh, I only know that uh, before I knew it, it was dawn and a rooster was crowing somewhere calling me to start my day. And so I finished the house and took Mary as my espoused wife, determined that her child would become my child too. <laughs> but I admit that many nights after she had gone to sleep, I had lay awake wondering how, how I would support her and the child. I mean, what if the townspeople were so offended by what they supposed had happened between us to think that they would no longer bring me their business? And furthermore, how, how was I to, to raise this child, this, this son of God, born to be a king? Well, then the day came with word that a decree from Caesar had been posted in Nazareth. Hearing it angrily discussed out in the street, I finally put down my tools and went out to read the proclamation for myself. I should have known. More taxes. And, and to make sure no one failed to pay up, they were going to take a new census, which meant that every adult male had to proceed at once to the, his hometown to be registered th there. Well, for me, that meant a, a long trip to Bethlehem. When I told Mary, she insisted on going with me. No, I tried to talk her out of it. Mary, it's unthinkable, I said. The, the, the roads are treacherous and, and, and the nights are still very cold. Why, why Mary, you, you might lose the child. But she calmly said that God would watch over her. Now I ask you, man, what do you say to that kind of reasoning? Huh? Not much. I let Mary sleep as long as possible on the day we were to leave, and finally I awakened her saying, if we're to be off before, before daylight, we need to get started now, dear. We ate hastily. I'm bound by a sense of urgency and a strange, strange sense of excitement. For you see, we, we never made a journey like this together anywhere. And, and we knew that in all likelihood that baby might well be born before we would return. Just where and when and how? <laughs> that we didn't know. I lifted her onto the donkey and we started for Bethlehem. We traveled four days. First south through the old towns of Nain and Jezreel. Then eastward across the boggy plains of Esdalon until we reached the Jordan Valley, and, and then down southward through that fertile, fertile uh, valley, and, and then finally back westward again up through the barren hills of Judea. Uh, Mary rode along uh, in spite of the cold, dry east wind, 
the, the skies were clear after the rainy season, but, but as I thought, the nights were still very cold. And yet, despite the dirt and the jostling and all the discomforts of travel, Mary seemed to be smiling a great deal, I suppose in anticipation of her coming child. It was nearly dark when our journey finally came to an end in Bethlehem. Oh, by then, Mary was too miserable to care about much of anything except a place to rest. Her cheeks were ashen, and I could see she was gripping the bundles piled around her until her knuckles were white. Hurry, Joseph, she begged. Hurry, please. I tried to. I'm pleading with those in my path to, to move over, telling him that it was urgent, that, that my wife was ill. Now, I, I was sure we'd have no more troubles now that, that we were in Bethlehem. All we needed was a room, a place at the end, of course, was what I was hoping for. I, I tried to encourage her, telling her, I'll soon have a place for you to rest, my dear. She just nodded gratefully to too miserable even to speak. When I arrived at the inn, the keeper was busy serving his many guests who had, who had filled his establishment beyond capacity. So busy, in fact, that he hardly had time to respond to my appeal. I'm sorry, he finally wheezed. We're full. You, you'll have to do what others have done and, and go find yourself a friendly yard somewhere to sleep in. But, but, but you don't understand, I said. My, my, my wife is in labor. She's about to bear a child. You, you, you must give a shelter at least for a few hours. But I can't, he said again, gesturing toward the many guests pounding on the, pounding on the counter demanding more service. You can see for yourself. There's simply no room. You know, I can't perform miracles. Miracles? thought in a flash of bitterness. Let God produce one for us now. Oh, you must help us, I pleaded, one more time. Well, that's when he told me of the stable and said we could find some shelter there if we didn't mind the animals. Well, I thanked him. But I tell you, I was sick at heart as I returned to tell my Mary that all I could arrange for was a stable. You know, to think that God had chosen me to look after her and the child, and the best I could come up with was, was a stable, uh, actually just a cave dug into the hillside there behind the, behind the inn. I can tell you for sure this was not the way I had planned it, not at all. This child should not be born in a stable among sheep and donkeys and hay and what else. I had imagined it would be with my family present. Neighbors clustered outside the door, friends standing at my side. And the house erupting in cheers at the first sound of an infant, a newborn baby's cry coming from the bedchamber. But I had to deal with things as they, as they were and not as I had hoped they would be. So I cleared out the stable as best I could through the dirty bedding outside and Hurriedly, I gathered up armloads of clean, dry straw, sprinkled it out, spread it out. Then I flung my coat down over the top of it. She said, yeah, I tried to make Mary as comfortable as best I could. And I was going to seek help when her voice pierced the night air. Oh, oh Joseph, no, Joseph, please. Don't leave me, please. Then I knew that even if I could find help at that late hour, I dare not leave her alone long enough to even go seek it. That baby was about to be born right there that night. Mary gave me instructions as best she could, and with fear, I prepared for the worst. For again, see, these are carpenter's hands, familiar enough with hammer and chisel, but not with the paraphernalia of a physician or even a midwife. Don't be afraid, Mary said, gripping my hand. We're forgetting something here, Joseph. This is God's child, and, and he will not abandon us. Weak and, and human as we are, 
God has chosen us as his servants, and he will help us. When I got the chance, I bedded down the donkey and, and built a small fire. As the night wore on, I would doze off. I wanted to spring up guilty and sick with alarm whenever Mary moaned or cried out. Finally, the hour of birth came, and her cries became more intense. Help me, Joseph. Oh, please, God, help me, somebody. I, I tried to encourage her to strive harder to pare down. And she, she gave it her best. And, and suddenly there came a ripping and a tearing and a gushing forth. And he, he came out of her. In blood and in pain, he came into this world. And I, I was the first one to touch him. This, this son of God, who was also son of man. I, I was holding him. I was holding Emmanuel. God, God with us. Jesus, the one who would save his people from their sins, was in my arms. I held him up for Mary to see him. Together we marvel at him so infinitely small. Then I helped her clean him up and wrapped him in the swaddling clothes that Mary had brought with her. And we laid him in a manger. But in that moment, I realized again that he was not really my own. He was not flesh of my flesh or bone of my bone. But he was a child of God, a child of my love. And so I prayed, Father, somehow let this child be the son of my love. Oh, God, I have so many questions. How, how can I be father to the son of God? Oh, Lord, show me how I fit into this plan of yours. Tenderly, 
How can it be the Son of God? How can it be? How can it be? How can it be? guys, can I get one amen from the guys? Yeah. Now I want to thank uh, Pastor Ron and LaDon for being here this morning. You know, we're, we're in this Christmas season and, you know, I don't know about you, but for me it's already busy. We've got all these things that, that we've got to do, all these things that we're thinking about doing. And it's important for us to really realize and to understand what, what we're celebrating. What, what this time of the year is, is really all about. And you know, so often we make this time of the year to be all about us. What, what can I get? What, what do I want? What do I deserve? And it's not really about that at all. It's about the fact that God loves us. Yeah. And he wants us to be a part of his story, just, just like Joseph, just like we heard today. You know what amazes me is that God uses ordinary people aren't you thankful for that? He uses ordinary people, but what he requires is two things. It's faithfulness and it's obedience. That's what he asks of you. That's what he asks of me. That we would be faithful, that we would be obedient, that we would understand that we all have a role in this story of Christmas. You know, the story is still going on today. And that we're a part of this. And that what God asks us to do is to take the greatest gift of all, which is Jesus Christ, and to share that with a hurting world, with a world that is lost, with a world that is broken, that's living in fear, that has no joy or peace. God's asking you and me to be a part of that story. But understand something, because we see it in, in Joseph's life. When you're in God's will, Things don't always go right. Think about that. And you know, some of you, you, you might be here right now, you might be thinking, you know, am, am I in God's will? Am I, am I doing my part? Am I doing what God has asked me to do? And I would say this, if things are not going right in your life, then maybe you're right where you need to be. Because that's where God is. And that's where God is able to move, and that's where he's able to work. That's where he's able to receive the glory. And understand, Emmanuel, God with us, that is still the greatest miracle of all. And that's what this time of the year is all about. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're just going to pray this morning. But I just want to encourage you today. You know, regardless of where you're at, regardless of maybe life circumstances right now, I want to remind you that you're not in this by yourself. That God is still Emmanuel. And that He promises to be with you right now. And so if you're here today and you would just say, Pastor Mike, I, would, would you just pray for me today? Because I, I'm going through some things. This is a stressful time of the year. I just need prayer. I, I, I just want to know that God's with me and I'm not alone. Would you just raise your hand today? And I, I, I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Hands all over the place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. See, you're not alone. Even now, God's given you peace. Even now, He's given you an assurance that His Spirit is speaking to your spirit, that you're not alone. And that He'll work the situation out for good. But we've got to be faithful and we've got to be obedient. 
God, I pray today for every hand lifted today. I pray for every heart that is open to you this morning. God, I thank you that your very presence, your very spirit is here with us today. And God, I just pray for family today. God, those that are going through life and maybe unexpected things have happened and come against them. Lord, for those that are here this morning, maybe they're fearful of, of what's coming. God, maybe folks are here today and they're just unsure. They have decisions and, and things need to be made, but they don't know what to do. They don't know what step to take. God, maybe our hearts are heavy this morning because this time of the year we're reminded of, of loved ones who are not here with us and our heart is heavy and we're saddened. God, maybe it's it's marriages and just we're, we're stressed, Lord. Whatever the situation may be, God, I pray that you would remind us today that you're with us. God, we are not in this by ourselves. You promise to be that friend that sticks closer than a brother. You promise in your word, God, to never leave us, to never run out on us, to never forsake us. And God, I pray right now that you would give all of us a peace that passes understanding. God, just continue to teach us and show us that we don't necessarily have to figure everything out, but God, you want us to be faithful and you want us to be obedient. God, when we do that, you will lead us to where we need to go. You'll give us the strength to do what you've called us to do. You'll meet needs along the way like only you can. God, this time of the year, our hearts are open to you. And we thank you for being Emmanuel, God, with us. We love you, Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, you know what, Pastor Mike? I, I don't know the Lord. My heart's not right. I've never asked Him to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. I've never made that decision. But today you want to. Today you want to be written into the story that God's still writing. You want to be a part of His family. If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand and we want to pray give you an opportunity to to respond to the voice of the Lord this morning is there anybody this morning God I, I turn back to you I've done it my way and it's not working I, I need you yes yes anybody else just, just lift your hand we're going to pray the Bible says if we believe in our heart hands all over the place thank Scripture says if we believe in our heart that Jesus came as a babe, yes. but that he lived a sinless life and died for our sins, that he was risen again. If we believe that, if we confess that, that he will come and live in our lives and he will change us. We're going to pray that this morning just right where you are. Maybe you're here today and saying, I, I should have lifted my hand. I didn't. Just right where you are, just pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to the earth. I turn to you right now. I open my heart to you. I repent of my sins. I confess them before you. I ask that your forgiveness, Lord, would just cleanse me. That you would right now make me your child. Make me a part of your family. God, continue to be Emmanuel, God, with me. Lead me and guide me through life. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we give the Lord just a clap of praise for hearts that have been open to him? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, if you raised your hand, if you just tell somebody today on your way out, just, just tell them what God has, has done in your life. It's remarkable. Well, Merry Christmas. Pastor Ron and Ladon, they're going to be in the the foyer, you can meet Joseph face to face, get his autograph. It'd be pretty cool. But uh, he'll be out there to talk with you. Just, just, just thank him for coming. Just thank him for coming and ministering today.
Amen. Hey, have a blessed day in the Lord. You don't have to worry about the Packers today. You, you don't have to worry about that. But uh, have a great day in the Lord. Hey, remember next week, Ugly Sweater Christmas program. Be here. Bring somebody with you. Bring your best and ugliest sweater. And let me just say this from my heart. Packer sweaters don't count. <laughs>